Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. S here. Uh, is anyone here? Can someone kindly let me know in the chat? Can you hear me? And can you see the screen? Can you see what's on the screen? By the way, if you are watching the recording, speaking of what's on the screen, uh, the lecture will begin at approximately the 15 minute mark. Is anyone here live, though? Can you hear me? Can you see what's on the screen? My audible, my mic appears to be working. Okay, someone will let me know eventually. In the meantime, we can do the, go ahead and at least put the try me question up. And get it centered there. Okay, so here we go. A zebra is initially spotted at location negative one five, okay, on the XY plane. And then the zebra starts walking around. After T hours, the zebra's location is given precisely by um, this uh, function, which we will call a vector function, R of T is equal to, well, the X component is given by X minus, oh, sorry, T minus one, excuse me. Whereas the y component is given by t squared minus 60 plus 5. Okay, this holds as long as t is greater than or equal to 0. The two questions for you are as follows. Does the zebra stop by the river for a drink? If so, when? Second question. Does the zebra stop by under the big tree for some shade? If so, when? You clearly see the river and the big tree. So you can go ahead and uh, give these a try and uh, share your answers in the chat. I'd like to like to know uh, what you think. Don't worry about right or wrong answers. Uh, this is not a quiz. So I uh, see we have five people, six people. Can someone please let me know, can you hear me and can you see the screen? Can you let me know in the chat, please? I will be here, I'm gonna turn my mic off. Uh, but I am here if you have any questions. So I uh, will begin the lecture right at 9.30 sharp.
Anyone have an answer yet? Does the zebra reach the river? Does he reach the big tree? Do you have anything yet? If so, uh, please share your answer in the chat and don't worry about right or wrong. That uh, does not matter. What matters is that you're trying. Uh, and I'm curious what, what, what you have. Anyone have an answer yet? All right, we have an answer for B. Uh, Chris says yes after six hours. Does anyone agree? Does anyone disagree? B is actually easier than A. The, the big tree is easier to solve than the river because there's only one point with the big tree, with the river. Uh, while there's infinitely many points we have to consider. So I won't give it away quite yet, but let me know. Uh, do you agree with B? or not. Uh, B is easier, so that, that's actually a, a good one to start with. Maybe I should have switched the order of the questions. Uh, we'll talk about the answer right at 9.30, by the way, to, to both of these, as we always do. Anyone else have an answer for big tree? Oh, yes. Uh, we have agreement. Okay. Yes, after six hours for B. Okay. What do the rest of you think? There's 22 of you out there. Well, I guess maybe one of, that, one of those is including me. But there's over 20 of you. What do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Still trying to figure out A. Yeah, A is a little tougher. Uh, feel free to use trial and error for this question, by the way. I haven't really taught you anything yet uh, regarding Chapter 5. We haven't officially started yet, so uh, any technique you use for this problem is, is, is fine. Um, for A, uh, the trial and error might be the easiest for now. I will, of course, t teach you uh, some uh, better techniques uh, in Chapter 5. But Chris, maybe trial and error is, is the way to go. I will give you a clue for the river. Uh, he does reach the river. Uh, the question is when. And uh, he reaches the river at a, a nice point. Um, where the x and y components are integers. He does not reach the river at square root of 2 uh, over pi or anything like that. So I'll give you those clues. But maybe trial and error is just the, the easiest way to go for now, for A. Okay. For the big tree, you can set up a system of equations. I bet that's what you did. Uh, but trial and error works for that, actually, as well. 
Okay, we'll begin in three minutes. Let me know if you have other questions. Uh, I am here. Ah, Chris, a point uh, for A is 2 minus 4. Okay, Chris claims that the zebra reaches the river at the point 2 minus 4. That does touch the river, and he claims that it happens after 3 hours. Do you agree? Do you disagree? We have two minutes. Let me know what you think. Uh, interesting thoughts by these folks here. We'll talk about them all in two minutes. Uh, but Chris, to go back to your previous question, yeah, we could do it that way. Uh, we could uh, figure out the equation of the river. Uh, it's just a line, right? It's just a line, and then you could um, equate that to the vector function somehow. You could do it that way, yes. I personally had trial and error in mind for this question, at least for the river. Uh, but uh, multiple ways to do things. Okay, it's 9.29. I'll just stay with my mic on. Any other, uh, any other comments from the 30 of you that are here? Do you agree? Do you disagree with anything that people are sharing in the chat? Still working? Well, it just hit 9.30, so we will talk about this now. Um, let's go. Uh, answers. Well, let's talk about the river first. Actually, this is the more difficult of the two. Uh, but yeah, Chris is right, folks. You see the zebra. He does reach the river at the point uh, two minus four. Okay, he does get a drink of water uh, at that point. So uh, yes, he does uh, reach uh, the river. And Chris, what did you say? Um, after three hours, I agree. Yes, it is after three hours of walking. He gets thirsty, stops at the river for a drink. Okay, how do we know this? Well, again, trial and error would be the simplest way to do this. Um, not necessarily the most efficient, but the, 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 the least sophisticated, the easiest. Uh, you just plug in three, and you see... Uh, 3 minus 1 is indeed 2. Uh, 3 squared is 9. Minus 18 is negative 9. Plus 5 is negative 4. So if you plug in 3 after 3 hours, you get the point 2 minus 4, and that's where the river is. Okay? That's a point uh, on the river. So uh, that's, that's how we can handle this. I will teach you better methods. Better methods once we start, once we start the section. Okay? All right, nice job, Chris. Um, what about uh, the big tree? This was actually easier, right? This you can set up um, uh, a system of equations and solve for that. Uh, but you can also do trial and error here. Uh, uh, I think everyone agreed that Post did. Yes, he does reach the big tree, and it is after six hours. I agree with all of you. Yes, after six hours. Good work, folks. How do we donate? Well, we could set up a system, or we can do the trial and error way. We can plug in uh, six. Uh, actually, this is more of an educated guess than trial and error because we need to get five, five. And, uh, well, if you plug in six and subtract one, that's going to give you five, right? That's going to give you five. And we need five in the y component, too, but check this out. If you plug in six, you get 36 minus 36 is zero plus five. Nice. So yeah, this one this one was definitely the easier of the two for multiple reasons. 
Okay, but mainly because it's just one point. So I agree with everyone. Uh, let me finish what I'm writing. Five, five. So yeah, the zebra reaches the big tree after six hours because the big tree is located at five comma five and R of six equals five comma five. Okay. Good, good. So thank you for participating, folks. This is what we're going to do today. We're going to look at these type of functions, functions that have two components, okay, or maybe even three components. Uh, we can look at 3D as well, okay? That's what section 5.1 is about, okay? So we're going to answer these kind of questions. How can we solve these questions without guess and check, okay, without making educated guesses? Okay, can we do it more sophisticated? Yes, we can. I'll teach you how. Okay, we'll do another example just like this with a lion, and we will uh, we will um, track his precise movements, actually. Okay? Um, yeah, can we trace out the zebra's entire path? Yes, I will teach you how. Okay, uh, I'll switch it up a bit, like I just said, with a lion instead of a zebra, but it's the same kind of question. Okay? That, folks, is what we will do in section 5.1. Part one, okay, this is a long section. It's going to take uh, at least two lessons, probably a tiny bit of a, a third lesson on Wednesday for me to finish this section, okay? That's okay, we're not in a hurry. There's only four sections in this chapter, so we're not in a hurry. All right, I'm Dr. S, and uh, let's begin section 5.1, Vector Functions, okay? Maybe a good place to start. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit, actually, make it easier for you to see. Maybe a good place to start would be, what is a vector function? Okay, well, let's start in 2D. A two-dimensional vector function is a function, we're going to call it R bar, okay? We're going to put a bar above the R to indicate it's a vector function, okay? That's what we do with vectors, right? We put the bars over them, okay? Uh, its domain is some interval I, Okay, and as you can see typed up, I is a subset of the real numbers, and it's an interval, and it's possibly unbounded. Okay, it doesn't have to be bounded. It could be bounded, could not be. Okay, uh, the range of R is in R2. Okay, the range of R is a subset of R2. Okay, if R is a two-dimensional vector function. Okay, there we go. That's a two-dimensional vector function, okay? I, again, can be possibly unbounded. In fact, I could be the whole real number line. In fact, that's what we see with this next example, okay? R is defined on the whole real number line, and, of course, you could just use R for that instead. That's obviously uh, perfectly uh, correct as well. Um, but the range is a, goes into the range is a subset of R2, okay? So and it's defined uh, by R of T, and you see it has two components, okay? Two components, since, uh, since uh, the range is in R2. This is an example of a 2D vector function, okay? The function, the vector function mapping uh, the, or I should say tracing the movement of the zebra at the beginning, that's also an example of a 2D vector function, okay? So there's two examples for you right there. Uh, question for you folks, what is R of zero? Coming back to this example, start off with an easier question. What is R of zero, folks? Can you put your answer in the chat? Much easier than the zebra question, right? What is R of zero? If R of t is equal to one over e to the t, well, that's the x component, and the y component is one over one plus t squared. One, one, thank you, Chris, yeah. R of zero is a 2D vector. Pretendo, yes. Sky, yes. Gamalela, yes. Uh, Nikake, yes. Very good, yeah. Lizzie, yes. Yeah. R of zero is a 2D vector because R is a 2D vector function, okay? In particular, it's one comma one, right? When we plug in t equals zero. Very good. But uh, you know this, in this class, we're not just interested in 2D, we're interested in 3D as well. So let's talk about what a 3D vector function is. It's very analogous, okay? A three-dimensional vector function is a function, we're still going to call it R bar, 
It's still a vector function. It's still defined on some interval, possibly unbounded interval, subset of the real numbers. Uh, but its range is a subset of R3, since it's three-dimensional, okay? Um, here's an example. Uh, again, the interval I happens to be unbounded, negative 1 to infinity. That, that, that's possible. Uh, here is a 3D vector function. R of t has x component t squared, y component natural log of t plus 1, z component or z component uh, cosine of t. Okay. Uh, another question uh, that's easier on the easier end, what is r of 0? Put your answer in the chat. What is r of 0? Oh, Chris, I just saw your question. Uh, by stating possibly unbounded, we are just using examples of unbounded. Yeah, yeah, it could be bounded. R could be from negative 1. Uh, we could uh, stop this at 4, for example. We could even put a closed bracket if we wanted to, yes. And, and you'll see some examples of bounded interval i's in, in just a little bit. Uh, lots of answers. Uh, they all agree, 0, 0, 1. Good job, folks. That is correct. R of 0 is a three-dimensional vector, okay? Three components. Okay, R of 0 is a vector with three components because R is a 3D vector function. Yes, and if you plug in 0, uh, this is what you get, okay? What about R of negative pi? Can you put your answer in the chat there? What is R of negative pi? What is R of negative pi? Anyone? I will give you a moment. What is R of minus pi? Have I stumped you? What is R of negative pi? Oh, undefined as it's outside the function's bounds. Yeah, Philip, I know what you mean. Uh, you're basically saying that negative pi is not in the domain of the function. Chris, undefined. Uh, yeah, there's a problem with the ln. Yeah, undefined, undefined. Yes, all of you are correct. Is undefined. Okay, we have to keep it in mind, the domain of the function, okay? Uh, negative pi is not, as Philip is saying, uh, is not in the domain. Okay, it's not in the domain. Why would it not be in the domain? Well, Chris has a point, too. If you look at the, the second component, uh, if you try to plug it in, uh, this is undefined. Okay. So I'm, I'm glad uh, Philip and Chris answered this differently. Um, they're, they're both right for, for similar reasons, related reasons, okay? It's undefined. Negative pi is not in the domain. And in, if you try to plug it in, you get this natural log of a negative. That's, uh, that's not right, okay? So you see here, folks, one component, the middle component, can affect the domain of the entire the entire vector function. Do you see that? How one component can affect the entire domain of the vector function, okay? T squared, cosine of T, those are defined for all real values. But there's a problem with this middle component, okay? And that changes the domain of the, that affects the domain, I should say, of the entire vector function. So that's interesting. Okay. Very good. Okay. Let's talk about these components. Let's talk about these components. Uh, let's go back to R2 for just a, a moment. Uh, if R is a 2D vector function, uh, then it's going to look like this, folks. It's going to have two components, two component functions, okay? Um, these are real-valued functions. X is a real-valued function. Y is a real-valued function, okay? These are called the component functions of R. Sometimes we just call them the components for short, and, and that is okay. 
Okay. So 2D vector functions look like this. Okay, they are composed of two real valued component functions. Okay. For example, uh, we've seen this example a few moments ago. If uh, you look at this 2D function, well, it has two component functions, okay? We call them X of T, which is, well, the first component, 1 over E to the T, and uh, has the same domain as R of T. And uh, Y of T, well, that's the second component, okay? This notation is standard, okay? X of T means the first component, Y of T means the second component, right? X before Y, you know that, that's standard, okay? Oh, what about 3D? I think we'll get a Z or a Z in there, won't we? So if R is a 3D vector function, it's going to look like this. It's going to have three components, okay? X, Y, and Z, or Z. I did not mean to include that T there. Excuse me. Okay, you have three component functions, and they are all real valued functions. Same story as before with the 2D vector functions. Now we just have a third component function, okay? Uh, these are still called the component functions. Okay, and if you're curious, yes, we could extend these definitions to any n-dimensional vector function, right? It would just have n real valued component functions. Okay, but we're going to focus on two and three in chapter in uh, chapter five. Okay, but you can extend this if you so wish. Okay, for example, uh, we saw this. Um, this has three components, but the domain of these three components must match must match the original domain. Okay, everything larger than. Uh, minus one, okay? Must match, what do I mean by original domain? The the domain of the vector function R, okay? It has three component functions. Here they are. They're all real valued functions, as you can see, and uh, their domain is, uh, well, uh, negative one to infinity, okay? So, yeah, just a note there. Note that the domain of each component function is the same as the domain of R, even though, yes, I can plug in any value for t squared, any real number. Yes, I can plug in any real number for cosine of t. Uh, doesn't matter, okay? The second component affects the domain of, of everything, okay? Uh, so, uh, that brings me to a question that I have for you, if you'll please answer in the chat, all you have to do is put uh, one letter, A, B, or C. Uh, here's the question. Suppose R of T is a 3D vector function, okay? Um, and that the domains, the natural domains, I should add that, the natural domains, okay? Every, what I mean by that is every value of T that you can plug in, okay? Without breaking a, a rule of algebra, you know, taking the natural log of a negative, for example. Uh, if their domains are dx, dy, and dz, or dz, um, using your intuition uh, from the above example, what do you think the domain of R will be? A, you take the union of these three natural domains. B, you take the intersection. Or C, none of these are correct. Oh, you, f you folks are fast. I'm too slow. Uh, B, 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 B. Yes, you are all correct. Yes, you take the intersection of all of these okay, of these natural domains. That will be the domain of the vector function R, and that will be the official domain of each of the component functions as well. Remember, they have to be the same, okay? Even though these are not the natural domains, they're the domains for these component functions because they're affected by the second component, okay? Very good, folks, very good. All right, uh, just want to make a note similar for uh, 2D vector functions. Okay, similar for two-dimensional vector functions. Okay, a lot of times, folks, uh, things hold for 2D and 3D. I'll just state them for either 2D or 3D, um, and then I'll just note that it's similar for the other case, okay? Um, this is, in fact, similar to any n-dimensional vector function, by the way. If it has n components, this is this is how you, you, you find the domain, okay? All right, good. Good, 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 good. 
Uh, we're talking about domains. What else is an important part of a function? Probably it's range, huh? The range is, along with the domain is important. So let's talk about the range, okay? Uh, let n equal 2 or 3. In fact, this holds for any n, but we'll focus on 2 or 3. Given a vector function, uh, i from rn, so it's either 2 or 3d, the range of r in either case is the set c, subset of rn given by uh, this. c is defined to be... Okay, and we always use the letter C for the range, okay? We always use the letter C for the range of the vector function in this class, at least. Uh, well, it is the set of all outputs of R of T, formally spoken R of T such that T is in I, okay? It's the set of all outputs of R of T. Okay. Well, that's just how the range works with normal functions, f of x, right? It's the set of all outputs, okay? S similar story here, okay? Essentially the same story, okay? Uh, just note that c is a subset of rn, okay? That's, uh, that's the difference, okay, from, from uh, traditional real-valued functions, okay? Uh, let me just write this down. c is the set, I want to emphasize, c is a set, okay? The range is a set of all outputs of R, okay? The range is a set, the set of all outputs of the vector function R, okay? Good. Oh, sorry, I see, uh, just saw your question. Uh, uh, Nagake, uh, can uh, can C can capital C be a proper subset of R N? Yes, yes, it can. In fact, it can be one point. Um, define R. Excuse me. Define R from the real numbers to R two by R of t, well, it maps every t to the vector 0, 0. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a constant, it's a constant vector function. Okay, R of 1, 0, 0. R of 1,000, 0, 0. R of negative pi, 0, 0. Then what would c be? c would be just the set 0, 0. So yes, it can be a proper uh, subset of Rn. Okay, it can, in fact, it can be a set containing one element. You are welcome. Thank you for the question. Okay, awesome. Uh, why do we use the letter C, by the way? Why not R for range? Wouldn't that make more sense? Well, we use C because uh, we think of the range of these vector functions, you know, if we draw the graphs, okay, if we actually draw them out, we think of them as curves, okay, we call them curves. Therefore, C is, is a natural letter to use, okay? So, here's a story here. Uh, for many vector functions, the set C can be thought of as a curve, okay, a curve in Rn, okay? In this case, we call C the curve parametrized by R, okay? Okay, and I'm talking about uh, the range, okay? This, I'm still talking about the range, the range C here, okay? We, we think of, uh, or we call the range C the curve parametrized by the vector function R, okay? And we call R a parametrization of C, okay? We call R a parametrization of C. C, okay. While C is a, you know this, it's a set. It's a set of vectors, right? It's a subset of Rn, R2 or R3. While C is a set of vectors, it can also be given by a vector equation, right? You saw this with lines, didn't you? I see in a period. Uh, you saw this with lines. Sometimes in chapter one, we wrote lines as sets, and sometimes we just gave uh, the vector equation for the line, okay? Both are acceptable, okay? Unless you're asked specifically for one or the other, okay? So we can give it as a set or as a vector equation, okay? The vector equation, x is given by r of t, where t is any um, element of the domain 
of the vector function i here. Okay, the curve C can also be given in terms of x and y, okay, for 2D vector functions, and x, y, and z, or z for 3D vector functions via what's called a Cartesian, a Cartesian equation for, for C, okay? Maybe we can look at an example. What am I talking about here? This example will, will illustrate everything. What do we need to do? Okay, I have a 2D vector function. R of t is given by, well, x of t equals t, and y of t equals t plus 1, right? x of t is equal to t, y of t uh, is given by t plus 1, okay? Those are the component functions, sorry. It doesn't it's supposed to be a T. It doesn't look very nice. Better. Okay. Uh, give the range C of R and then give a rough sketch of C. Okay. So C, we know this is what the range is, right? It's R of T such that uh, T is in the interval, right? We can say this, uh, everything greater than or equal to 1. If you wanted to go ahead and write t greater than or equal to 1 here, yeah, that's that's logically equivalent. That's perfectly fine, okay? Perfectly fine. Um, but you know what? I know what r of t is, so I can, I can do a little better here. I happen to know r of t is t comma t plus 1, okay? I'll even, I'll even uh, use the t greater than or equal to 1 just to emphasize uh, that is certainly okay. So either notation is fine, okay? Um, that's the range. Uh, Chris, I saw your question. How would we represent the general Cartesian equation? Uh, this is coming, yep, this is coming. There's some work that needs to be done. There's some work that needs to be done to get the Cartesian equation. And it will depend on the actual vector function, right? Every vector, every unique vector function gets a, a unique uh, Cartesian equation. And I, uh, there's a trick to that I will show you today. Um, okay, how would we sketch this? Okay, I, I haven't taught you uh, anything about sketching. Uh, so right now, uh, we have to go with uh, the the classic method. Of, oh, we'll just plot some points and connect the dots. Okay, I will teach you better methods uh, in the next week. Okay, and uh, the next two weeks actually. But for now, we're stuck with stuck with um, just plugging in points. Why do I start with t equals one here? Well, I need to start. I need to start at one. Okay, the vector function starts at at one. Okay, so uh, let's plug it in. Okay, so t t plus one, right? X component is t. Y component is t plus one. So uh, there we go. This is me plugging in different values of t, getting a few different points on the graph. Okay. Uh, now we can now we can uh, plot these. Okay. I've got an x y axis. Notice the x and y are labeled. That's important. We should, must always label our axes. Um, t equals one. We have the point one comma two. So that would be right here, right? That would be right here. Maybe I can make this a little bigger. And we can write this by saying, you know what? When I plugged in 1 into R, I got, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I got the point 1, 2, okay? We should label our points, okay? That's a theme in this chapter. We, we label important points, okay? You'll, you'll see that. Um, you'll see that more later on. Uh, then if I plugged in 2, I got 2, 3. Okay, so I should explain what's going on there. If I plug in 2, I get the point 2, 3, okay? And I, I like this because I see what's going on in terms of x and y, but also t, okay? I can see what's going on in terms of t as well. So this is a really nice way to label our points, okay? Uh, what's last? Uh, if t is 3, we get 3, 4. That was right here. So I will label that if t is 3 and I plug that into r, I get the point 3, 4. Okay. I see what's going on. We have a straight line. We have a straight line. So that's, uh, in, in this case, three points is enough. 
And this goes on forever, right? T is greater than or equal to 1. There's no bounds. There's no bounds there. There's no upper bound, I should say. Okay? And we should always label the direction in which T is traversing. Okay? So a nice arrow will do that. That's another theme of, of chapter 5. Okay? So you'll see more of that. Um, there you go. Any questions? This is the least sophisticated way to draw a graph, to sketch a graph of a, of a two-dimensional vector function. More sophisticated ways coming up. This is not classified as a ray. Uh, oh, this is not classified as a ray, not a line, because it's a... Yeah, yeah, what we have here is, is a ray. Yeah, yes, Chris. It's not a line because nothing happens to the left of neg uh, to the left of positive 1 okay nothing happens okay so yes this this looks like a ray it is not a line it is not a line very good very good observation other comments or questions okay well, Chris, you asked about the Cartesian equation, and I promised you an answer. Here you go. Here's a tip for you. When converting from vector equations, which look like this, to Cartesian equations, which are in terms of x and y, the trick is to eliminate t. Eliminate t. That's the trick. You can do this by getting t in terms of x or getting t in terms of y. Uh, that is the trick, okay? Eliminate t. Only have x's and y's in your equation. That's the Cartesian equation, okay? But also, don't forget the bounds. The Cartesian equation will also have some bounds, okay? I'll show you in a second. If the Cartesian equation is of this form, this is probably the nicest form you're going to see, where y is equal to a function of f of x, okay? This is when the curve passes the vertical line test, okay? When you sketch it out on the xy plane, it passes the vertical line test, okay? Then the bounds will look something like this, okay? x will be in between um, maybe real numbers, maybe... Uh, infinity on the right, maybe negative infinity on the left, okay? And uh, I have less than or equal to signs, but uh, they could also be less than signs, okay? Or one could be a less than sign and one could be a less than or equal to sign. It, it depends on what the domain is, okay? Uh, and again, and I'll show you an example uh, which will clarify. Um, but I want to cover this equation too. What if, what if... Uh, the Cartesian equation is something like this. X is equal to some function of Y, okay? So it may not pass the vertical line test, but passes a, a horizontal line test, okay? Then the bounds will look like this, okay? Y will be between two values, possibly numbers, possibly minus or plus infinity, okay? And uh, let me just stress, these can be, can also be, you know, they can be less than signs, right, uh, et cetera. Maybe you have one less than sign, one less than or equal to sign, okay? And same with x. Okay, I just don't want to write out all the cases because uh, it's such a tiny, tiny difference. Okay, and I will write this too. Bounds can be infinite. They don't have to be, but they can be infinite, okay? It can be uh, infinite. Let's look at an example. What, let's, uh, let's clarify what's going on here. Example, r of t is a 2D uh, vector function, okay? Uh, x of t is t squared plus 1. y of t is t to the fourth minus t squared. Here I have a bounded interval. The the domain is a bounded interval this time, okay? That can happen. Domain, well, is, uh, we can call this uh, the domain of R. I like that notation. It's nice and clear, and as long as we're consistent, uh, it's nice and efficient. Uh, this is the interval 0 to the square root of 2. Okay, here we have a bounded interval. 
Okay. Sometimes the interval is bounded. Okay. The only rule is the domain has to be an interval. Uh, what about uh, the range? Well, we know how to do this. First of all, yes, we call the range C, okay, because it's, we're going to think of it, it's a curve. And it is uh, t squared plus 1 t to the fourth minus t squared such that, well, t's got to be bounded by 0 and root 2 exclusive. Okay, so this, this, is, this is how we can answer the range. Okay. Um, what, where the question gets interesting is where we look at the Cartesian equation. What is the Cartesian equation for this vector function? Okay. The trick, the tip, if you will, that I gave you was we need to eliminate t. How can we eliminate t? Well, here's how. x, right, because the Cartesian equation is in terms of x and, and y, but x is shorthand for the first component, x of t. Okay, x is short for x of t, which we know is t squared plus 1. Well, that would imply that t squared is equal to x minus 1. You see that? That would imply that t squared is equal to x minus 1. Okay, so now I've got t, well, t squared in terms of x. Okay, and you might be thinking, aren't you going to square root both sides and say t is equal to plus or minus the square root of x minus 1? Well, I don't want to... And I don't need, uh, that's kind of ugly, I'll, I'll do it if I have to, but I don't have to because I have t squares here, right? t to the fourth is t squared, that squared. So I actually don't have to. I don't need to mess with the plus or minus, that alone isn't nice. I'll do it if I have to, but it's not nice. Uh, and I also don't have to mess with the square root, which is also a benefit. So I'm just going to stop there. I've got t squared in terms of x minus 1. Okay, in terms of x, excuse me. And I know it equals x minus 1. Okay, well, what about y? Similar story with y. y is shorthand for y of t, the second component, which is uh, t to the fourth minus t squared. t to the fourth minus t squared. Okay. And... Uh, that implies that y is equal to, like I said before, t to the fourth is nothing more than t squared, that squared. And I take the time to write this. Not that you have to. This is basic enough. But uh, I just want to uh, make clear what I'm thinking. You can see what I'm going to do next. I'm going to combine both of these equations. Okay, I know t squared is x minus 1. I have y in terms of t squared, so I can combine these. And I get y is equal to t squared, which is x minus 1, that squared, minus t squared, which is x minus 1. Folks, that's the Cartesian equation. I've eliminated t. Okay, I, I should simplify. I will. But, but this is it. Okay? The trick is to eliminate t and get things in terms of x and y. That's what the Cartesian equation is all about. Okay. So T eliminated. Okay. That's, that was our goal all along, to eliminate T. All right. Uh, can I simplify this? Yes, I can expand. I think I'll just give you the final... Uh, answer I won't bore you with the basic algebra, but you should check me. Uh, you will get y equals x squared minus 3x plus 2. Okay, that's the Cartesian equation. But I, I, I rephrase that. It's part of the Cartesian equation. Uh, because I said earlier, don't forget the bounds. The Cartesian equation has bounds too. Okay, so let's talk about the bounds. Okay, and notice uh, this is 
this is the form y equals f of x, right? x squared minus 3x plus 2. That, this, is, this is a function of x. Okay, so the bounds, I can say y is equal to some f of x. So I know uh, the bounds will look like this. Let me phrase. So bounds will look like x less than or equal to something. Okay, I don't know what those will be. Okay, I don't know what those will be. I will find them out. Okay. Well, in order to find them out, I need to go back to the vector equation. And uh, where do we start? Where do we st stop? I, I start here. And I stop here, right? The, the vector function starts at t equals 0, and then it ends at t equals root 2, okay? That will help us get the bounds, okay? We start at t equals 0, okay? So we're going to plug that in, okay? And I'm going to plug it into x because I want to know what x is bounded by, okay? That's the rule. That's the rule I stated above. If y is a function of x, if the Cartesian equation is of that form, I should say, then the bounds look like this. x is in between two values, possibly infinite, okay? Let's, let's uh, plug in 0 into x. Um, x. What was x again? x was t squared plus 1, so I plug in t equals 0, I get 1. Okay, and then you do the same thing. Where did we stop? We stopped at t equals root 2, so I'm going to plug that into x of t. Okay, and there I get root 2 squared plus 1, that is 3. Okay. So now I can fill in, I can fill in those blanks. I know what x is bounded by. It's bounded by 1 from the left and 3 from the right, okay? That's how we do this, okay? Mostly basic algebra so far, right? I haven't done, haven't done anything, uh, anything too fancy yet, okay? That's the Cartesian equation, okay? That's how you do it. Eliminate t and then figure out the bounds. Now I'm ready to give the answer. Cartesian equation. Here's the full answer. Well, y is equal to x squared minus 3x plus 2. And the bounds are as follows. x is in between 1 and 3, uh, inclusive. Okay. I know it's inclusive. Uh, because these are actual points on the on on the curve, okay? Because I plug in values and I actually get them, okay? They're actual outputs, in other words, okay? So they're on the curve, so they get included, okay? They get included. Questions, comments, anything for me? Questions, comments, concerns, anything? We will do more examples. Uh, we're not done finding Cartesian equations uh, quite yet, okay? We will do more examples. Uh, but I did promise you uh, an example with a lion, okay? Instead of a zebra, now we have a lion, okay? Suppose, class, that you're filming a lion, okay? You're out on safari, you're filming a lion, uh, moving around, okay? You're following the lion as the lion moves around, okay? Uh, you're not following him around. You're, you're, you're stationed at a very high tower, okay? But you're following him with your camera. Uh, the lion's movement, similar to what we saw with the zebra, is modeled by a 2D vector function. And yes, it is the exact same vector function that we just looked at, Okay? t squared plus 1 is x of t, t to the 4th minus t squared is y of t. Okay? But it actually models the movement of this lion. Okay? Where t is between 0 and square root of 2. Let's say that t is time in hours. Okay? Typically, that's what we think of. Uh, t is time. Okay? That's why we use uh, 
the letter T to, to, to designate this independent variable, okay? It's usually time. Okay, well, say it's in hours. So the bounds indicate here that you filmed the lion for exactly the square root of two hours, okay? Let's also denote the range of R by C as always, okay? We will always do that, okay? I made that clear already. R of T is the same as above, okay? Let's track the lion's movement, shall we? Where is x? I don't see x. I see y. Let me label my axes. And let's let's track uh, the exact movement of the lion. And if you can do this, then you could go back for practice and track the exact movement of the zebra. Okay? We can do that too. Okay. I am going to break this down. How, how do we do this? Okay? How do we graph this thing? Well, it helps to break things down into parts. Okay, so I will do that for you here, and then you can follow this strategy as you do your homework, okay? Uh, first, give the initial point of the curve C. What is the initial point, though? Well, in other words, state the position of the line where you first started filming, okay? So initial point is where things started, okay, where the curve starts, okay? Also, plot this point on the Cartesian uh, plane, okay? So we already talked about this. We know... Uh, starts starts at zero, okay? Things start at time equals zero here, okay? T equals zero. Okay? So I plug that into R, okay? That will give me the initial point, okay? I know we did this with X of T for the uh, previous example, but that's, that's because we are figuring out the Cartesian equation, okay? This is different. I want the precise location of the lion when you first started filming at t equals zero, okay? I want to know both uh, components. So, uh, yeah, plug in zero, and you'll get one zero, right? Folks, this is called the initial point. This is called the initial point. One zero, okay? Uh, as instructed, let's plot this. Let's plot this. One comma zero. There, th there's where the lion starts. Okay. And I can uh, label this very nicely in terms of t and x, y. R of 0 equals 1 comma 0. Okay. This is, this is how I want you to label your points. Okay. For, for vector functions. Give me the value of t. Give me the x and y uh, coordinates as well. Okay, this is a this is a nice efficient way to do this. Okay, r of zero equals one comma zero. Done. Okay, that's where the lion started out. Now, give the terminal point of C. What's the terminal point? Well, it's the position of the lion where you stopped filming. Okay, naturally, initial point is where you start. Terminal point is where you stop. Okay, we stop. Stops at uh, t equals root 2, doesn't it? Okay, so uh, the information uh, helps us. Okay. Um, but, uh, of course, if uh, this were infinity, right, if it is t less than infinity, then there is no terminal point. That can happen too, okay? Sometimes that's the answer, okay? Question is, what's the terminal point? Sometimes the answer is, there is none, okay? But there is one here because we stop. We stop at a real value for t, okay, square root of 2. Anyways, let's plug that in. R of root 2, uh, this will give you 3, 2 when you do the arithmetic. Folks, this is the terminal point. This is the terminal point. As instructed, let's go ahead and plot this terminal point. 3, 2 happens at R of root 2. Okay. So, uh, 3, 2, that's where the lion stops. Doesn't look like the lion went all that far during your film. But we have to label it. T is root 2, and the xy coordinates are 3, 2. Okay. So, there we go, folks. We have an idea of the lion's movements, kind of, sort of. We know where the lion started 
and where the lion ended up at the end of uh, your filming. Okay. We still don't know very much, do we? We still don't know very much, do we? I think I'm going to stop this here. Uh, I just want to make the note. We will finish t uh, tomorrow. Uh, I just want to ask some questions. I mean, it's possible the lion walked in a straight line. That's certainly possible. But, I mean, the lion could have done this, too. <laughs> So we still don't know very much right now, do we? Which one is it? What are the precise movements of the lion, okay? Don't know. I don't quite know. But that's for next time. For now, this is all all uh, things we will do tomorrow. We are not in a hurry, as I've said before. I kind of knew we would uh, not finish everything today. I am not worried at all, nor should you be. Um, as we have two minutes left, this might be a good time for uh, recap trivia, because I don't like the word quiz. That's depressing. Uh, match the parameterization to the correct curve. Okay, I'm going to zoom in. You, you know the question. Match the correct curve parameterization to the correct curve. Share your answers in the chat. When it does hit 1020, you are allowed to go, okay? I won't hold you captive, but you're certainly welcome to stay late and uh, finish if you don't finish in the next minute, okay? So share your answers in the chat, and then we will talk about these in just a few minutes. Again, when it's 1020, you are free to leave, uh, but you can stick around. All right. We have two and three answers. That one is B. Yes, yes, uh, I agree. This is B. Yeah, the, the X component always equals the Y component. Okay, and uh, that's what we see with B. Yep, the X component equals the y component with this vector function, r of t equals tt. So yeah, I, I agree. What else you got? By the way, it is 1020, so you are free to leave if you wish. Otherwise, stick around just a few more minutes, and we will finish. Lizzie, 2 equals c. Anyone agree or disagree with Lizzie? Chris agrees with Lizzie. Uh, I think I agree, too. I can tell because the x component is always non-negative. In other words, we never go to the left of the y-axis. That's what happens with c. Yep, I agree. I agree. Uh, three, we have some uh, some disagreements. Oh, two, yeah, okay, we don't. Two is equal to c. Yeah, I agree, yes. Uh, and then uh, Yomelela, uh, I need to learn how to pronounce your names, Yomelela, yeah, I think that's okay. Uh, I wish you could talk with your mic and you could correct me. Um, but you're saying 3 is equal to A, yes, I most certainly agree. Uh, similar story, the Y component is always non-negative. This vector function never travels below the x-axis, and that's what we see with A. And then, yeah, by a... Uh, it's okay if you use Sharon. Okay, I will do. I will use Sharon um, from now on. I agree, Sharon. I agree, Chris. Uh, Tariro, I agree. For by process of elimination. Um, oh, sorry, I put this in the wrong spots. This is supposed to be A there and D here. Okay, a similar story. Uh, the X component is always non-negative. That's what we see with D. Awesome. Good job, folks. Very good. Um, that's all I have for you for today. I'll see you tomorrow at 930, where we will continue Section 5.1. Um, we have not even gotten to circles, so uh, we can ignore that. We will cover shapes. We'll finish what we're doing, and then we'll get into circles and some other shapes as well. Okay, I'm going to stick around in case there's any questions. Uh, but I can only stick around for a minute because I, I have a meeting I have to get to. Um, 
So, yeah, have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you tomorrow at the same time, 930. Take care, everyone.